Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship online at Blythe Road Baptist Church. This is for Sunday, uh, September the 26th. It's the first Sunday of fall. The leaves have already started to turn. It's a joy to be able to worship together in this way, and we pray that you'll be blessed by your time spent with us as we're blessed by worshiping together here. This morning, we're continuing our, our journey through Ezra and Nehemiah, which we've called Return, Rebuild, Renew. And uh, this morning, uh, we have Ezra coming onto the scene. Ezra, uh, a man of uh, the Word of God, a man of worship and praise, and a man of prayer. So let's worship together. As far as announcements go today, friends, I'd like to announce uh, the continuation of our, our services that we're holding uh, each Sunday outside under the walnut tree. In, uh, in this corner here of our church parking lot. And uh, they've been a wonderful blessing. We've had two of them so far. And um, I just wanted to say about those two, if, if the weather is inclement and we need to cancel them, what we'll do is we'll put a message out on the church's Facebook page. And uh, you can access this, this Facebook page from the church's website, which is www.blithwood.org. And there's a little tab at the top that's, that's it's the Facebook symbol. It doesn't matter if you have Facebook. I know people will say, well, I don't have Facebook. What am I supposed to do? Just click on that, uh, that Facebook symbol, the little F, and, uh, and, and you'll see if there's a message saying that we're canceled, then, then don't come. But otherwise, uh, we'll be here, God willing, as we say and weather permitting. And, and as I say, it's, uh, it's been a real joy and a blessing to be able to do that and resume gathering together. The other uh, announcement I'd like to make are about a couple of meetings in October as we continue down the, the, the path of, 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 of wanting to discern God's will for our church, for our future. We're going to be holding two meetings. One is on October the 12th. Uh, they're both between 7, 8, uh, sorry, 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. So the first is on October the 12th, and that's with a church called Sanctus. And then there will be another meeting on October the 27th, that's 27th, and that's a Wednesday evening again from 7 to 9. And that will be with, with the CBOQ uh, to discuss a, a CBOQ program, which is all about church revitalization. So those meetings are on the 12th and the 27th. Now, ahead of each of those meetings, we're going to have a time of prayer. So we're going to have an hour of prayer on October the 5th, and we'll, we'll have these meetings from 7.30 to 8.30. Um, and, and, and they will be, uh, we hope to be able to be in the sanctuary as well as uh, give you the option to, to, jo to join on Zoom if you can't be here. So those are October the 5th and October the 19th and we're planning those from 7.30 to 8.30. So an hour of prayer time together and I'll be speaking a little bit more about those later in the sermon too. It's, uh, it's a blessing and a joy to be able to worship together, friends. And as we, as we prepare to worship, let's come before God with prayer. And I'm going to read a, it's a morning prayer, which is, uh, is from the Celtic Christian tradition. So let's pray. The will of God be done by us. The law of God be kept by us. Our evil will controlled by us. Our short tempers checked by us. Speedy repentance made by us. Temptations sternly shunned by us. Angels' music heard by us. God's highest praises sung by us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our call to worship, friends, is this. Deal bountifully with your servants so that we may live and observe your word. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. We live as aliens in the land. Do not hide your commandments from us. And as we prepare to praise God together, we're going to sing, praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed redeemer, the one who has brought us back to God. We're going to sing, uh, you are good. Continuing on that theme of, of, of the Lord is good, is steadfast love endures forever. Uh, and then we're going to sing, Lord, Lord reign in me, which is a prayer that, that, that God would be reigning within us. So let's, let's sing. Oh, 
Our reading this morning, friends, is, uh, is in three parts. I'm going to be starting uh, in Ezra chapter 7, uh, starting from verse 1 to verse 15. And I'll just say before I begin here, one of the, one of the wild things about Ezra and Nehemiah is you, you see a mix in the writing. There, there's sort of third per- person narration, which is, is how our passage starts this morning. Um, you also have things like letters. There's, there's things included in there like letters from, from the king. And then you also have first person narration where, where you, we hear the voice of Ezra and, and the voice of Nehemiah. So we have all of these things contained in these books. So uh, we're going to start here, chapter 7, verse 1. After this, and this is about, I'll just say too, before we begin, this is about 60 years after the scene that we read last week where, where the first wave of people came. After this, in the reign of King Artaxerxes of Persia, Ezra, son of Sariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahitub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Marioth, son of Zerahiah, son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eliezer, son of the chief priest Aaron. This Ezra went up from Babylonia. He was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses that the Lord, the God of Israel, had given. And the king granted him all that he asked, for the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. Some of the people of Israel and some of the priests and Levites, the singers and gatekeepers and the temple servants also went up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. They came to Jerusalem in the fifth month which was in the seventh year of the king. On the first day of the fifth month, the journey up from Babylon was begun. And on the first day of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem. It took him five months. For the gracious hand of his God was upon him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statutes and ordinances in Israel. This is a letter, this is a copy rather of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave to the priest Ezra, the scribe, a scholar of the text of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes for Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, to the priest Ezra, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, peace. And now I decree that any of the people of Israel or their priests or Levites in my kingdom who freely offers to go to Jerusalem may go with you. For you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to make inquiries about Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and also to convey the silver and gold that the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem. And then I'm going to flip down now to verse 27, same chapter. And and, and here we have Ezra speaking. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king to glorify the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, and who extended to me steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage, for the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me. And then into chapter 8, and I'm going to start at verse 15. The people now that Ezra Ezra is gathering a group of people now to make the trip. I gathered them by the river that runs to Ahava, and there we camped three days. As I reviewed the people and the priests, I found there none of the descendants of Levi. Then I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jarib, Elnathan, Nathan, Zechariah, and the Meshulam, who were leaders, and for Joyarib, and Elnathan, who were wise, and sent them to Edo, the leader at the place called Kasaphia, telling them what to say to Edo and his colleagues, the temple servants at Kasaphia, namely, to send us ministers for the house of our God. Since the gracious hand of our God was upon us, they brought us a man of discretion, of the descendants of Mali, son of Levi, son of Israel, namely Sherebiah with his sons and kin, 18. Also, Hashabiah and with him, Jeshahiah of the descendants of Merari with his kin and their sons, 20. Besides 220 of the temple servants whom David and his officials had set apart to attend the Levites. These were all the Levites. These were all mentioned by name. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might deny ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our possessions. 
For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and cavalry to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king that the hand of our God is gracious to all who seek him, but his power and his wrath are against all who forsake him. So we fasted and petitioned our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. And this is the word of God, friends, and we thank God for the reading of it and for the hearing of it this day. Amen. Amen. There's a great line in Paul's letter to the Ephesians where Paul writes this. It's it's in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. He writes, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What a wonderful truth. We who were far away have been brought near or, or have been brought back, if you like. And during these weeks of fall, we're looking at a story of the people of Israel, the people of God who are brought back to Jerusalem through these books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And and last week we talked about why these stories are are in our Bibles. Is it not just ancient history, we may ask? Uh, But we remember, and we're called to remember, those with whom we're connected through faith in Christ. And we praise God for God's hand at work in this history. and, and, And we learn from it. We learn what it means to be uh, God's people, and, and what it means to, to apply our lives to the story of God. And, and you'll notice I said apply our lives there, and, and I have to pause for a moment and say that I believe we do well when we're considering, when we're considering God's work and, and God's story. I think we do well to ask the question, how do we apply our lives to this story? Uh, oftentimes, uh, Biblical principles, b- biblical truths, biblical stories, they're, 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 we're talk, we're, we talk about them, we, we, we teach them, and, and we say, we talk about how this applies to our lives as if uh, there's something that we can insert into our lives or that we should insert into our lives as a good thing, in much the same way as we might insert other good things in our lives, like a healthy diet or, or exercise or, or self-care or any of the things which we're apl- invited to apply to our lives. And I'm not, of course, against any of those things. But when we're talking about the Word of God, we're, we're, something, we're talking about something much more deep than that. And I have found for myself, it's, it's good. And I would challenge each and every one of us to ask this question of themselves. What does it mean in my life to apply my story, my life story, to the story of God, the story that we read about in this Bible, the story of creation? And, and of fall, and, and of promise, and of redemption, and of, of promise, the promises of Christ, and, and consummation, that day that, that, that we look forward to. So what does it mean to apply our lives to this story? And I want to apply my life to this story. I'll state that publicly, and it probably comes as no surprise. I hope it doesn't come as a surprise. I want to commit my life to this story. But the thing is, for the people of God, it's not just about the Christian leader or Christian leaders. And one of the things that that we find in Ezra and Nehemiah is is the focus on the community, the focus on the people. Up to this point in in the history of Israel, as, as we have it in our Bibles, it's often been about a leader. And you have these kind of heroic figures, people like Moses and and Joshua and and, and judges like Gideon and and Deborah and and kings like David. And and oftentimes it's about the leader. But at this point in in, in the history, uh, things seem to change. The focus is on the community of of the people of God at large. At the same time, of course, we recognize the, the, the two men for whom these books are named, Ezra and Nehemiah, who, who, who kind of act as catalysts. They act as catalysts for the, the, the community of returned exiles who are, 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 are returning and rebuilding and renewing. And so today, as I said, we have Ezra striding onto the scene. Ezra, it's short for Azariah. Azariah means God has helped. What a great name. God has helped. He's a man who took the word of God seriously. He was a man whose task it was to catalyze renewal. And at this point, the renewal that we're talking about is a renewal of the heart. And I'm glad for this. 
Because if there's one thing that I find myself in need of, it's, it's, it's a renewal of my heart. I need a renewal of my heart. And so, and so the question for, for us at Blythewood is, do we seek to be renewed? We're talking about church revitalization, church renewal. Do we seek to be renewed? This is a question we need to ask ourselves. Do we seek a renewal of our heart? And really, this should be what any church of any time seeks. But at times, perhaps, the need might be felt a little more keenly. Our situation here at Blythewood is maybe a little more precarious than we've ever experienced, or at least that, that than we've experienced in a while. We might even say we're reeling a little bit, I think. And here's the thing. We can talk about rebuilding an institution or renewing an institution. And in our story so far, we, 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 we've, we've heard about the return of a group of, of exiles from Babylon. Last week, we talked about the first thing that they did together. First things first. First thing was worship together. They sang. We talked about the people who didn't have a song uh, in Babylon. Now they have a song. They've been brought back. They have a song, just the same way we have a song. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. That's our song. By the end of chapter 6, and, and I hope you're going through this because we're not going to cover all of this Sunday by Sunday, but you can read the interim bits. At the end of chapter 6, we've read that the temple is, is rebuilt. And the people again worship. <clears throat> but the problem then is the same problem that we face today. The renovation or the rebuilding of, a, of, of, of an institution without a renewal of people, without a renewal of hearts, will result in an empty institution. It won't mean anything. The re rebuilding or realigning or refiguring or rebranding of, of an institution such as the church without a renewal of the people's hearts, it's going to be meaningless. It might even mean that, that the building or the institution becomes a, a drain or even a millstone around the neck, an empty institution. And this is serious stuff. And we're in serious times. And Ezra was a serious man. And we have much to learn from this catalyst. And as I say, we look at these stories because of the story of God, they're the story of the people of God. We read these stories to be reminded of who God is, to learn from them, to praise God for God's hand in them, and to ask, what do these stories mean for our present and our future? What does it mean to apply our present to this story? What does it mean to our future? So what was going on here, as, as we read, was Ezra was sent by the king uh, at Xerxes. And as I said, it's about 60 years now after the temple has been rebuilt. And the problem was what the people were worshipping, the God who the people were worshipping, the ways of God, were not being reflected in what they did. And so we read, and I'm, I'm going to read a couple of these passages. We're, we seem to be going through a lot of Bible in these, in these weeks. I know it's only been two weeks, but it's good, I think. It is good. When we read the latter part of, of, of the prophet Isaiah, the, the, the latter part of the prophet Isaiah is set in these times of, of the return of the people. Uh, we, we read things like this, and this is from Isaiah. I'm going to read Isaiah 58. <clears throat> a shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do, why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, says God, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is, is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? And then God says this, is, not, is this not the fast I choose? 
to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? We read the same sort of thing in the prophet Malachi. And again, the, the prophet Malachi is, 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 is talking about this situation that the Israelites are in, in history, where they've returned to Jerusalem. And this is Malachi 1, 6 to 8. And this is, again, God, but Malachi speaking the word of God here. A son honors his father and servants their master. If then I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord of hosts to you? O priests who despise my name, you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food on my altar. And you say, how have we polluted it? By thinking that the Lord's table may be despised when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not wrong? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not wrong? Try presenting that to your governor. Will he be pleased with you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. And these are hard-hitting words and sometimes we need to be hit hard with the word of God. What kind of offering are we bringing? Present yourselves. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. Paul wrote in Romans 12. We don't read these words in order for us to say, tsk, tsk, those Israelites, they just didn't get it, did they? And congratulate ourselves on how much better we get it. We read them because we don't get it either. We read them because our hearts are in need of renovation. Because we need to be taught because we never come to an end in this life of learning the ways of God and the love of God. Because there is a gap between what we believe and what we profess and how we act. Because we need to ask ourselves questions. We read a verse like Proverbs 3, 6, and, and, and it says, In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. And we say, Fantastic. Wonderful. What a wonderful promise. And, and it is a wonderful promise. The question we need to be asking ourselves is, are we, acknowledging in him, are we acknowledging him in all our ways? Are we acknowledging God in all our ways as, as people, as individuals? Are we acknowledging God in all our ways as a church? And we say, well, what then shall we do? What then shall we do? And into the middle of this situation and into the middle of these questions strides Ezra. God has helped. Because it always starts with God, who is good, whose steadfast love endures forever. This was the God to whom Ezra belonged. We read at the beginning of chapter 7 that his lineage went all the way back to Aaron, Moses' brother the first chief priest. We read that he was a scribe, one of those whose task it was to preserve and communicate the legal traditions of Israel. We read that he was skilled in the law of Moses. Uh, the word for skilled here also means quick. He was skilled. He was an expert. He was quick with the law of Moses. And I have to make a small digression here at this point. I just, I just want to stop here for a, a few moments and uh, on, this, on this thing of, about the law of Moses. Um, let us not fret, dear friends, that we are talking about the law of Moses. Um, when we talk about the law of Moses in this context, we're, we're talking about the word of God that Ezra held in his hand, as the king said. And, and we're talking about the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first, that's the word that we use for the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. It's also known as the Torah. And um, actually, it was a question recently on, uh, on Jeopardy. What are the first five, or the first five books of the Bible? Uh, what is the Pentateuch? James Amodio, he, he got that. This guy is just uh, killing it in Jeopardy. He seems unstoppable. People sometimes say things like this. Uh, it, the Old Testament is all about law and the New Testament is all about grace. Um, we need to make sure we're getting this right 
because that's not true. God has always been about grace. The grace of God always comes first. The Pentateuch, remember, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Pentateuch tells the story. It tells God's story, which I was talking about earlier. And even in the Pentateuch alone, we see a story of creation, uh, of fall. And I must say, even in the fall, there was grace. Remember that God clothed Adam and Eve. There's grace even there. It's a story of creation, of fall, of promise made, and of deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt. It's a story of a covenant made. And then it's a story of ethical requirements, the law. Grace always comes first. Deliverance always comes first. The people of Israel were delivered from slavery before God gave them the gift of the law, which was a description of how they were to respond to their deliverance and how they were to respond to God's steadfast love for them. Grace, grace always comes first. As Christians, we're not the people of God because we conform to a law, but because God has by grace delivered us in the person of his son and in his life and his death and in his resurrection and ascension and coming return. The law or the ethical command, it was summed up by Jesus. Jesus summed it up like this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind and your neighbor as yourself. The law, the ethical requirement is, is the good and fitting and proper response to God's grace. And may it always be our prayer that God is leading us in the ways of loving God and loving one another. Jesus said he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it and to call his followers to an even greater righteousness. And so he said things like love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Of course, Jesus detailed this righteousness in the famous Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 to 7, which we spent some time in recently. Serve God and not wealth, Jesus said. Beware of practicing your piety in front of others so that they may think well of you, Jesus said. And he said other things too. Strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And of course, I'm going to flip over to this. We, we read some of, of, what, of what Paul had to say. And again, we looked at this recently. We, we read some of what Paul had to say in terms of of, of, of what God requires of us. Let love be genuine. This is Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold on to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. It's, it's this great list. It's just coming out with them. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. And of course he goes on. I won't go on. But you can read that yourself in Romans 12. And these are the commands of God. End of digression. So as we come into the second half of this sermon, friends, we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at three ways, three, three things that Ezra personified, which, um, which help us to know what it means to respond to God's goodness and grace and love as the people of God. And here's the first thing. It was that Ezra was a man of God's word. And we read this in chapter 7, verse 10. Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord. He had set his heart on it. He sought it. And he not only sought to obey God's word, but as someone has said, he, he sought deep engagement. Deep engagement with God's word. This is a model for the Christian teacher. For Ezra had set his, his heart to study the law of the Lord. Deep engagement and doing it. Just do it as the phrase went. And I suppose still goes. Just do it. Not only did he study it, not only was he engaged deeply with it, he did it. He lived it. And then the third thing, and to teach the statutes and ordinances, statutes rather, and ordinances in Israel. To teach it. And so I say, hold, hold your teachers, no matter what church you're part of. 
hold your teachers up to this standard. Hold me up to this standard. But as I said earlier, it's not all about the leaders, of course. We all have a part to play in this seeking and in this teaching and in this learning. And it must be said again, we never come to an end of learning about the love of God and the ways of God in this Christian life. We never come to an end. It's not just about the leaders. Teachers can't teach without people who long to learn. And so I say, may God stir our hearts. I'm praying a lot recently. May God stir our hearts. May God stir the hearts of our Blythewood family and indeed all the families that are represented in our viewing and, and families or faith, faith families that we're tied to and connected to. May God stir our hearts. May we want to be a people who are renewed. Are we studying God's word together? Are we seeking to put God's word into practice together? Are we teaching and are we learning together? And, and you know there are a lot of different opportunities. We want to provide as many opportunities as we can here for us to do this together to be engaged in God's word together. And Ezra provides the model, and someone has written this of Ezra. He is a model reformer, and that what he taught, he first lived. And what he lived, he had first made sure of in the scriptures, with study, conduct, and teaching, put deliberately in this right order. Each of these was able to function properly at its best. Study was saved from unreality, conduct from uncertainty, and teaching from insincerity and shallowness. That's good. So this was the first thing about Ezra, a deep, deep engagement with God's word, studying it, doing it, teaching it. And then the second thing I want to say about Ezra is he, he was a worshiper. And we see worship and praise going on in these chapters in a really wonderful way. And uh, as I said, if you've got your Bible, I hope you have your Bible open in, in chapter 7, verse 27. We've got this, this, we hear Ezra's voice for the first time. And what is he doing? He, his, his voice breaks into the story. And what, what are his first words? They're words of praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our ancestors, who put such a thing as this into the heart of the king. He praises God to glorify the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And, and to extend to me, and who extended to me rather steadfast love before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty officers. I took courage, Ezra says, Ezra tells us, I took courage. Blessed be the Lord, the God of our ancestors, whose steadfast love endures forever. I took courage for the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered leaders from Israel to go up with me, because... As I always like to say, we're not called to do any of this journeying on our own. So that's the second thing, Ezra's praise break. Sometimes in the middle of something, we just want to praise God. I hope God stirs our hearts to that too. And finally, dear friends, Ezra prays. And when we're looking at chapter 8, we didn't read the whole thing, but you can read through it. And there's a lot more detail in it, uh, in the story of the people who return. This is kind of the second return. There'll be a third one when Nehemiah comes, but this is the second one right now we're looking at. And there's a lot of really wonderful detail in chapter 8 particularly. And again, it's written in Ezra's voice. It's written in the first person in, in what is essentially a memoir. And, and I came across as I was preparing for this, Morning, I came across a great definition of memoir and, and, and how a memoir differs from an autobiography. And, 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 and auto, an autobiography focuses on a person, whereas a memoir focuses on the events in which a person lived, through which a person lived. And this is certainly what we're reading here about Ezra, Ezra's, Ezra's memoir. It's focused on the historical events, the things that are taking place. And, and Ezra and his people, uh, the people who are going with him, are, are, are going on a, a trip. And they're facing, it's precarious, they're facing precarity. They know where they're going. They're going to Jerusalem, but they've never been there. They don't necessarily know what's going to meet them when they get there. We've talked about precarity last week and how it can drive us toward God in a whole new way, and I pray that it does. 
But they're, living, they're leaving rather known lives of comfort in Babylon. And they're heading out into the unknown. And we look at the story and, and we see what is the first thing that they did. The first thing that they did is they wait. They're heading out on a journey into the unknown. And the first thing they do is they wait together. Chapter 8 verse 15 goes like this. I gathered them by the river that runs to Ahava. And there we camped for three days. They wait. He goes on. He says, as, as I reviewed the people and the priests, I found that there were none of the descendants of Levi. Where are the Levites? We can't go without the Levites because remember, worship is of primary importance to the people of God. We can't go without the Levites. Where are the Levites? And so Ezra goes on, since the gracious hand of our God was upon us, they brought us a man of discretion of the descendants of Malai, son of Levi, son of Israel, named Sherebiah with his sons and kin, 18. And now they have the Levites. And dear friends, we do well to examine ourselves and we do well to examine ourselves as a group in case there's something missing. And really, when you think about discerning God's will for our congregation, it's kind of like setting out on a journey, isn't it? It's a, it's a journey in which the destination isn't known. And before they set out, I want us to know to the depths of our hearts what the first thing is that they do. They pray. Before they set out, Ezra and the people pray. They pray for a safe journey for themselves, for their children and for all their positions, possessions rather, they commit everything and everyone in prayer. And they do this together. And so I want us to ask ourselves, dear friends, and it's a hard question, but we're thankful for God's grace and we're thankful for God who will renew hearts when we ask him and stir hearts. But let us ask ourselves, what are we missing as the people of God at Blythewood? What are we missing? Are we a praying church? Are we praying together? We have two meetings in the month of October. I mentioned them at the start of our service, October the 12th and October 27th. We have two meetings which have to do with seeking God's will for us here. One's with another church. One's with CBOQ. And before each of those meetings, as I said, we are going to have a time of prayer together. We're going to set it up. We're going to make it available to everyone, whether it's in person or whether it's on Zoom. And so my question for us is this, and my challenge for all of us is this. Are we going to be a church that prays together? before we start off on a journey? Are we going to be a church that prays together? Might we even be a church that fasts together on those days of prayer on October the 5th and October the 19th? Those are both Tuesdays. If I told you that I would fast those days, would you fast with me? Or would that just be too crazy? Would we be able to say with Ezra, so we fasted and petitioned our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty? And I pray to God that the answer will be yes. Because without a renewal of heart, how could we ever claim to be a people who's, who, who's, who, 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 on whom is God's gracious hand? How could we ever claim to be a people on whom God has laid his gracious hand? Last week we talked about worshiping together. This week we're talking about being engaged in God's word and a little bit of talk about worship again and about being a people who pray together. And so, friends, may God give us all the will to be deeply engaged in the Word, to study it, to do it, to teach it, to learn it, to worship Him, and to come before God as one people in prayer. And may this be true for all of us in the coming weeks and in the coming months. God grant that this is true for us all. Amen. Amen.
As we respond to God's word, friends, we're going to sing as, uh, as we normally do. And uh, this song is a prayer. Uh, speak, O Lord. And, um, and part of this prayer is, is asking God to take God's truth, plant it deep in us and shape and fashion us in the likeness of Christ. So may this be our response as the people of God. May this be our prayer now as we sing. As we continue to respond to God's word for us, friends, we're going to come to God now with the prayers of God's people. So let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you that you invite us to approach your throne of grace through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and through the Holy Spirit, through your Holy Spirit. And Father, we confess today that we don't come to you through any goodness of our own by any means. We confess to you, Lord, that, that our profession has not uh, been reflected in our action, that in our, in our hearts, in our words, and in our deeds, we have not loved you with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. And so, Father, in your mercy, we plead forgiveness. And we ask that by your Spirit, you would mold and shape us, Lord, into the people that you would have us be. We ask, Father, that you guide us. O oh, thou great Jehovah, guide us. We pray for all of those facing difficult choices, whether professionally or whether personally, for leaders of nations, for leaders of our nations. Father, for our church, we pray, guide us. Lead them all their journeys through and use us to show a way to the one who is the way, the truth, and the light. I am weak, but thou art mighty. For all of those, Lord, who feel vulnerable, abused, or at risk, hold them with your powerful hand and show us how we may be your hands, how even our weakness might be a conduit for your strength. Bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. For those who live today, Lord, in real hunger because crops have failed or land is bad, or because they have no reward for their labor, or because no one wants their labor, or they're too unfit to work. Feed them now and evermore, and prosper the work of all of those working for both short-term relief and long-term quality of life. Bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. For those who have a hunger for meaning and purpose, for those asking themselves today, God, where are you? Jesus, who are you? Feed them now and evermore that they might find God in Jesus Christ. When I tread the verge of Jordan, for those, Father, facing death or serious illness, for those anxiously awaiting tests or surgery, and for those who care for them and watch with them. And we pray, Lord, for our sister Muriel. We pray for our brother Wally, too. Bid their anxious fears subside. And make us agents of your loving care so that whatever side we are landed, we and all your people may know your care and your love is stronger than death. So then, Heavenly Father, with songs of praises, songs of praises, we will ever sing to thee, sing to thee. We will ever sing to thee. And we thank you, Father, that you've given us a song. And we pray all of these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen.
One thing about the people of God is the people of God have always lived with promise. And we stand as children of the promise, as one of the songs that we sing goes. We stand as sons and as daughters of the promise, of promises like, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, and of promises like, behold, I come quickly. So let us sing about these promises on which we stand, standing on the promises as we're sent from this time of worship. Let's sing. about Moses' brother Aaron today, dear friends. So let us, as we're, as we're sent from this time of worship together, let us go with, uh, with Aaron's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Let us all go now in peace, dear friends. Amen. Amen.
hold up. Okay. So let's dog go by here. Morning. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship online. Thank you. 